Dare the monsoon with the Honda WRV with offers up to 57000 rupees this November. Visit your nearest Honda car showroom today. Hi, hello and welcome to Cinema Express. My name is Ram Vekatshrikar. Today we have um, Mr. Charlie Sarov, the cinematographer of the latest horror film uh, Smile. Uh, to talk about his work on the film, to talk about his frames, to talk about the emotional uh, repercussions of his frames. Uh, I'm so glad to have you, Charlie. Hello, hello. How are you? Thanks, Ram. Thanks for having me. Excited to talk about it. I'm glad that it's playing in India. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so my, my very first question would be, is the script of a horror film as scary as the film itself? Not for me, to be honest. I... Because I've I've shot a couple of horror films now and I've, and several short horror films as well, and I am a big fan of the genre. I, I I kind of understand what goes into the process of making it. So for me, it's not that scary. But what I'm looking for is things that I think an audience will find scary. Um, don't get me wrong; like I, I can still be be brought into the world of it being, you know, quite suspenseful and 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 if it's a very dark theme. I can be taken with that and it might make me feel something, but I don't really get scared because I, I know what would go into making it, whether it's a jump scare or a creature or something supernatural hiding somewhere. I'm thinking about like what, you know, how that could be done. And, and usually when you do that, it's very like practical and, you know, what makes it scary is all the different elements combined. It's the script, it's the performance, the cinematography, the, um, and then of course the, you know, the, the music and all that sort of stuff, the editing, the pacing, so off a script level, not so much, but um, but I can, yeah. I, I what attracted me to Smile was that there were a lot of there were a lot of dark themes, but it was um talking about something very important, which is mental illness and and trauma and and how trauma is contagious and it and how it can affect people and and you know it's very hard to shake off. So that I saw that in the script, and I and I I think. I believed it would have an impact on on people, and and that's one of the reasons that really drew me into it. So. Perfect. So yeah. your previous horror film, Relic, you had also shot the short film uh, of Relic, right? And it got later expanded into a feature film. So it's it's uh it's fair to assume that you have seen the project with you have you have witnessed the project, you know, evolve from a short film to a feature film, and you were much connected to it. But with Smile, you came into the project much later right once i think once after the whole script was ready so can you talk about uh how you enter a project and how your association with the project or how long you have been associated with the project kind of changes uh the way you approach it yeah i think it can do naturally just because like with with relic we shot the short film creswick which was the proof of concept, as you said. Um, and I had worked with Natalie Erica James, the director, for some time. And I I know her sensibilities and her style. And, you know, we became good friends. And I I think you develop a shorthand. So um, by the time I shot Relic, it was it felt a little bit more second nature. But I, I do feel like with Smile, like Parker and I spent a lot of time before we officially started prep and shot listed and watched references and and I got to know him quite well as a person and he became quite a good friend so you know in a sense I still had quite a lot of time leading into Smile to sort of understand what we were doing um that said some other projects you don't know the people as well you you will come onto it at quite you know later notice and um you might not build up as much of a relationship um and it can be a little bit more difficult but sometimes that's so still okay too you know being a bit more spontaneous and just sort of figuring it out as you go like but uh, for me, I, I, I believe finding those relationships and, and getting to know the person and getting to know the director really well um, and building that language before you even start shooting, you know, being just really being on the same page is so important because I think that's where the best work um, can happen, just when everyone understands one another and, and has that partnership. So. So I'm reading a book by Sidney Lumet, Making Movies by Sidney Lumet. It's, 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 it's such, such a wonderful book. And the filmmaker talks about why it's very important that the cinematographer and the director are on the same page. So that's a recurring uh, uh, that's a recurring point he keeps making in the in the book. He's saying that we are at the end of the day. The greatest uh, victory for me is when I discover that the that the whole team like be it the cinematographer, be it the writer, when everyone knows that they are making 
the same film and for that a lot of preparation is important like in order to find that middle ground uh what what was the preparation for smile like before you guys actually uh commenced filming what was the preparation process like yeah sure um so with parker and i we first um we both live in los angeles and he actually lives quite close to me um a lot of the other team were based in new york city we could because we shot the film in new jersey so we didn't have as much interaction with the other team um you know until until we went over to the east coast so parker and i were two of the first people to really start working together and we would meet up and shot list and watch references watch movies he would show me things that he liked i would show him things that i liked and then we just sort of got on the same page and then you know he'd been approached he'd he'd been involved with this film for longer than i have he obviously wrote it so he had a lot of ideas for how things um how he wanted things to look and and how different shots were to be designed and we would talk about that and then we would we would figure it out sometimes we would we would grab our phone and just shoot you know little things around the house and sort of try and figure out different angles and and stuff like that um so yeah shot listing was very important to us and you know i would show him lighting references i would um build a, a a lookbook you know and we would talk and you know about that and um so that was it that was a that was the important a really important thing i think we did um because we didn't know each other we hadn't known each other for long unlike like natalie and i who have been friends for a long time and some other people that i've worked with um you know i really got to know parker quite well over that month it was, it was about a month i think before we maybe six weeks before we officially went to the east coast and started prep with the rest of the team um, so that was invaluable. Um, I think that was the most important thing because when we got to New Jersey, all the noise, you know, there's lots of people and Parker's very busy with casting and wardrobe and we're looking at locations and I have to talk with my team, the gaffer and the grip and and there's just so much more going on that Parker and I didn't have the time to be able to sit and just work on shots and ideas. Like, so I think that was very, very important. Looking back on it, like if we didn't have that time together, I think you know, it would have been a, um, it would have, I'm not saying it would have hurt the film, but I just think that we wouldn't have gone in with as much of a understanding of one another. And, you know, I wouldn't have had a, as much of an understanding of his sensibilities. So I think that was very important. And I hope in the future to do more of that because I, yeah, spending one-on-one -on -one time with a director is um, invaluable um, as it is with the production designer and even the producers and everybody, everybody has their role. But um, if you really want that partnership to work on set, I think having one-on-one -on -one time with the director, you know, for a while before everything else starts is is very important. I, I find it very important, yeah. Great. Uh, since you spoke about Lookbook, can you share a little bit about what goes into the making of Lookbook? Is that where you find the, the color scheme of the film? Is that where you find the pitch of the film? Like what goes into the making? Because uh, it has to take into consideration a lot of things, right? The production design, the walls, the colors of the costumes the characters will be wearing. So can you talk about uh, how you arrived on uh, uh, yeah. the look of the film, like finding the pitch of the film? Yeah, sure. Um, so from a cinema and photography standpoint, I think it encompasses everything like what you're saying, like even the production design and the colors of the walls and things like that. That said, the production designer will obviously have their own take on it and they will do their own lookbook and we all get in sync with one another. But definitely when I create a lookbook, I, I do include things like that, the color scheme and all of that stuff. But um, essentially, I just look for any type of artwork or image. It, it could be other movies, of course. You know, you, you look at screen grabs from different films from different eras that speak to you artwork's very important um maybe because it represents an emotion like i remember putting together the, a, a montage of images that represented trauma to me and a lot of them were just black and white sketches of people that have gone through hardship in their life and there a lot of them had this sort of feel to it you know a lot of people you know they were just drawings and i and i did that you know just sort of and i think parker appreciated that because then he understood that i well, he knew then that I kind of understood the theme, you know, so things that demonstrate that you have an understanding um, of the vision uh, are important. Photography was a, is, a, is a big one, like, of course, anything visual, you know, that whether it be color, it could even be a documentary. It doesn't need to be from another film. It could be from a music video, a commercial, anything that kind of represents something, an idea. So usually I keep them quite simple. Some people like to write a lot on there and talk about all different things. I like just to sort of speak with images you know, maybe you, you have a, a lookbook and it starts with um, just an overall image that sort of represents the film. And then the next page might just be artwork, you know, just photo like paintings. 
And then another page might be photography. And then two more pages might have some like broken up into screen grabs of different movies you like. And I, and then I kind of keep it at that. And then I think that's enough to sort of uh, create the conversation. And, and if the director likes it, great. If they don't, that's also very important because then you know, you know, I think it's important to find out what they don't like. So sometimes I'll put something in there and they're like, no, nah, that's not it. That's fine. That's a good thing because then you know, you know, so. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, what are some of your references for, for Smile? Sure. Um, so some films that come to mind, one that um, that both Parker and I were excited about, there's a, there's a Todd Haynes film called Safe. Um, it's not necessarily a horror as such. It's more of a psychological like Psychological. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, but it's about, it's similar themes. It's about a, a protagonist that goes through m mental illness, succumbs to mental illness. And, you know, a lot of people around her don't take her seriously. Um, she goes to, you know, a lot of lengths to try and help herself, but it doesn't really, you know, it's, and, but we liked the way it was shot as well. The spacing and the emptiness of frames and the color, the different colors at light and, um, composition and the texture and things like that. That was a film that comes to mind. Um, Parker shared a reference uh, with me, Possession, um, a European film. Uh, yeah, that was a, that's, a, you know, it's a crazy kind of horror, but like we love the way the camera moves and the tension of that and and how sort of absurd it gets at times. That was definitely a big influence on Parker that he shared with me. Um, yeah, there was a few few films. like the We love the way the camera moved in um, um, Killing of a Sacred Deer. Uh, that was a film right, we watched right. together. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know if Smile necessarily has a lot of that, but there are elements, you know. It might even only be like a shot here or there or just an influence. Uh, that's all it needs to be. It's not like we want to go in and be like, shoot it exactly like Killing of yeah, a Sacred yeah. Deer, but there was definitely I shots the in the hospital. And, yeah. So, um, yeah, there was that. And then the television show The Servant was another series that um, that uh, Parker put me onto. We, I, I really enjoyed that. M. Lan Shyamalan, yeah. Um, he, uh, we love the way the camera moved in that. Um, so that was a that was a series that we watched, and you know there was a lot of purpose in the way the camera moves, and we, we yeah, it's very, that. it's quite, it's quite economical and motivated. There's no moment in in either uh, sacred the killing of the sacred deer or servant like when the camera moves, you know that yeah. it's motivated. It's not yeah. just. For the sake of it, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's what we try to do. Yeah, that's what Parker and I always try to do, for sure. You know, hopefully we got it right. But I, I think, you know, we're all learning as well. But I think they, they were really good references to fall back on. And um, yeah. Perfect. And now getting into the, uh, into the depths of uh, Smile, I really like how you used, it's, it's extensively shot on wide lens, right? So... It's extensively yeah. shot on wide lens. We always get a hint of what's happening in the background. But then the scene keeps intercutting between an extreme wide shot and a close-up of... The close-up is almost like a like a profile shot of of, yeah. of the character that, that we are witnessing. Can you talk about uh, the psychological impact that you guys wanted to create with yeah. the wide lens? Like, what is the emotional uh, uh, impact that you guys wanted to create in the viewers sure um we used a lot of wide lenses for a couple of reasons but you know essentially we wanted to show rose's journey into mental illness and depression and trauma and something when people go through those type of things that it, it, it feels quite lonely and isolating so we wanted to be very up close and personal with her and but still allow the audience to see a lot of what's around her, her environment, whether it's empty or whether there's people that are just crossing by and not noticing her. Or we also wanted to make the you know give the audience the feeling that there could be something lurking in the shadows. We didn't want to be on tight telephoto lenses where everything becomes compressed, which you know everything's subjective. So you could you could argue that going telephoto and being in here is is a good way to show trauma as well because it's isolating in a different way but like parker and i felt that we wanted to go the opposite and shoot on wide lenses and be out and you know see her quite isolated in her spaces and and um and you know just give people that feeling of unease and and you know something could be lurking around or jumping out of the shadows and then then come in but then still be on a very wide lens and um to yeah just to sort of carry that feeling over um yeah, I think that's. A, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, but yeah, we, yeah, that does. we wide lenses definitely played a big part. And when we went to longer lenses, quite often we wanted to do that to show it, you know, provoke a different feeling or um, something that we did do in 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 Rose is we never had an over the shoulder shot, you know, over the shoulder coverage. We always wanted 
Rose to feel alone. Yeah. So we, yeah, we deliberately yeah, didn't yeah. do that. We didn't want to connect her with anybody else. So that was another lens choice. Another thing we did was um, always, if we were shooting coverage between two actors, like whether it be Sosi and maybe Joel or one of the other characters, we would um, always shoot Sosi on a slightly wider focal length. And then we would match it to the other side, but go slightly longer. Again, just to have that difference in like reality and subjective, objective, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, so that was a, yeah, that was a few of the lensing things we did. So. Wow. So I, I wanted to ask you this because Relic was shot on, it had a conventional scope, right? But whereas yes. uh, with, with Smile, it's it's full. It's 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 1.85. Uh, what is the exact? Uh, it was actually two, two to one. Yeah. So we oh, went okay. a little bit wider than 1.85. But we really liked them. Um, so both Parker and I love anamorphic and scope. Um, we, we did shoot Relic. Uh, it was on spherical lenses, but we cropped it for scope. I, I love that aspect ratio, 239. I feel like it's a very powerful aspect ratio where, you know, you can put really put people or anything in and heavily weight it to parts of the frame. So, and it says a lot, it just feels bold. I, I don't know. And, and obviously with anamorphic, the um, field of view is incredible. You know, it's great for, you know, wide vistas and things like that. It is uh, something that I love, but we, Parker actually came to me and he said, like, he, he loves that aspect ratio too, but he was, he wanted to explore two to one because he'd seen quite a lot um, of films and TV series shot in it recently and that, that were quite effective. And we just thought that a lot of the locations that we were going to be in, you know, being a little bit higher would serve the story a bit more. So, you know, I like I know there's some films, I believe um, like Lisey's story was a, was a series that's online that was in two to one. I think um, a lot of Ari Aster's films, I believe, Hereditary and Midsommar. Midsommar, and, Midsommar, yeah. Yeah, and we, we looked at that and we just thought it's it's a good balance between the two. We weren't really a big fan of 169 or 185 for it, but we just felt we needed a bit more height. So two to one was something we, we went with and it's becoming more common. Um, I would, I'd happily shoot on two, two to one again, depending on the project, but I I, I enjoyed the format. It, it, it Yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting way to work. It was my first time shooting two to one, so yeah. How different was it? Like, how different does your framing become? Uh, yeah. When you I, when you're adapting to a new aspect ratio. I mean, it just depends. I mean, you're always just looking for the right composition. So it doesn't matter what you're on, even if it's four by three. You know, you, the, the, you still need to find it. Um, the one thing I'll say that I find a little bit more difficult about higher frames, like two to one, is with Relic, for example, when you do scope on a spherical lens, it's a little bit easier to light things sometimes because you have like a lot more space that you can even put a light in shot. Sometimes you don't like to do that because you want to be able to control, like, you know, rack the frame up and down a little bit. But um, I I do like that if you're in a tight situation, um, you can actually put a light in the shot and you know that it's going to be blacked out later. Um, so you can really model things, prop, you know, nicely around people's faces and stuff like that. With... Um, with smile, we were on such wide lenses on a high aspect ratio, it's a bit harder to to get light where you need it. But um, so yeah, we you know fortunately my my gaffer Joel Minnick and key grip Ethan June did a great job. They had my back and they're very exper like experienced. So you know we got there, but it, that was a, I think that's a different approach between scope and and uh, two three nine. I'm sorry, and two to one for sure. Yeah. Great. Since you spoke about lighting, uh, it's 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 vital in horror films that the danger that threat that uncertainty is quite vital in horror films right you never know uh from where a ghost or something will be will be jumping in so you have to maintain the shadows and the dark and the darkness perfectly and one of the one of my favorite bits from smile is when uh rose is having a difficult time to sleep and she yeah. turns this side and you see someone standing yeah. there like it 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 was such a it was such a scary scary moment and yeah. these are things that you guys achieved through right uh, through lighting like if had the had the had the corner been properly lit there is no uh, surprise there there is no scare element there and yeah. even though even though there is uh, in 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 rose's house even though there isn't anything, we are always looking for something. Like, is there something? Is there someone hiding uh, in those shadows? Uh, yep. Can you talk about using shadows to to manipulate viewers, to to keep the viewers intrigued, and your whole lighting pattern? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess my philosophy is like what you don't see is important, as is is as important as what you do see. So it's about like, sometimes it's like about starting with a blank canvas of nothing and then going, well, what, what does, what do we need the audience to see? So 
you know, is that like a crack lamp that we can motivate some light off to see a little bit of rose? Is it some moonlight? And then, you know, everything else is dark. And then, well, okay, we don't want it to be completely dark back there. So, because we might need to see something lurking. So, you know, I, I guess it's, you know, they, they say painting with light or, you know, it sounds a little cliche or whatever, but it is kind of true. You know, you look at the frame and you're like a little bit here, a little bit there, a lot there. You know, that's sort of my philosophy is like, well, what, what do we need to say here? Like, you know, I, I would prefer to start with nothing and build up rather than light and then take down. I think that's, that's, that's definitely one of my approaches. Um, and then you're right. Like we don't, we didn't want to give away too much uh, in with, um, you know, letting the audience see too much into these sorts of areas. We wanted just a little bit of a hint. And, and, a, and a lot of that is also controlled in the color grade. We had a really amazing colorist, Dave Cole, who, um, you know, we spent time together in the color suite and, and that's where you can also refine that, you know, like sometimes things might be deliberately a little bit brighter, but then you have the information to, 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 to make it darker and, you know, make the, 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 the shadows more rich and things like that. So I think as a cinematographer, you need to learn to work across all of the, 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 the spectrum now, because with digital technology and all the things available to us, um, and even film, you know, it, it's it's mixing all the different technologies now too. So you kind of need to, you know, see it through and and know that you've got you know a good colorist and all of that stuff. So yeah, uh, lighting and and you know a, a lot of that's in the in the grade as well. I definitely want to be the sort of person, the sort of DP that lights in camera. You know, I don't want to rely on post, but it definitely is a great tool to enhance it. And and sometimes they have your back and they can you know fix some things and <laughs> you know yeah. but uh yeah you try and get it right on set and then and then and then hopefully they can just help elevate it so. perfect i also like how the film uh avoids a lot of horror cliches like for instance uh it uses a lot of colorful locations like be it rose's hospital or or her, uh or many locations they are not typical grim uh scary yeah. locations apart from Obviously, it does enter that proper horror territory in the last twenty minutes, uh, but apart from that, it 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 had a it had a colorful vibe to it. Even sure. uh, even the very first scene where you know that iconic where uh, she witnesses her her, uh, her 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 patient commit suicide, it's yeah. not a typical typical uh, horror film film location. Uh, yeah. And I particularly liked uh, the the last twenty minutes stretch where it's where she's just holding that lamp and going, I felt it was such a classic uh, touch to a film that was so far, uh, that so far was was colorful. Can you talk about the lighting, that uh, that dark setup towards the end? And yeah, I, sure. yeah. Yeah, well, firstly, I'll say, I actually quite enjoyed working on some sets and some scenes that didn't have this, the typical horror elements to it. And I'm, I'd often talk with, uh, with Parker about that and our production designer that we, we had to go through some different looks and I quite enjoyed that. The hospital is quite bright. Her family house, her own house is a little bit sort of in between, you know, but then, and I, and I guess that is also a little bit of a story arc as she descends more and more into and succumbs to her illness, things are very dark and, you know, unhinged. So I think it worked on a story level, but, um, but yeah, I really enjoyed the last, the third act in the, in the old house. Uh, it was a fun, it's a fun way to light. And I think I, I learned to do um, a similar style on Relic because, you know, when, you know, the yeah. the characters are walking around those corridors, it was lit in a similar way, a similar approach. You know, they had a, a cell phone light, a mobile phone light um, and a flashlight. But in this case, in Smile, she had a, you know, the gas lantern, the old. Um, so yeah. I, I I wanted to, yeah, it was a, it's a fun approach. Essentially, you use the prac source, but then you just use like little increments of other light. And now, you know, with the LED technology, you know, with fire and flame effects and stuff like that, you know, she'd be walking around with the lantern but, and, and our gaffer would have, um, you know, like a flame bar set to not a real fire, but, you know, like the LED fire effect and we would match the color temperature. And if she was walking around and looking at things, we would, you know, sort of move with her and have that sort of like, um, you know, fire effect. And and then I used, and, and then a little bit of moonlight ambience coming in. It's just, you know, everything's very dark and I, it's a fun, fun way to work. But again, it's just like, what do you want the audience to see and, and how much? And, you know, it's, yeah, I like starting with very little and then building up. Um, I, and, you know, these cameras now, like they, they see in the dark. So <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's a fun way to work. But, but I, I was happy that the film, for me personally, the, the uh, I, I'm happy that it wasn't, 
you know, live that way for the whole film, which is fine, but I liked being able to do some different things and then ending in that location was really cool. So, yeah. One of my favorite things about the film is the point of view shots where we have scary people looking straight into the camera with a, with a uh, creepy yeah. smile and you go full full close up uh, on their on their faces uh, tell me about that creative choice because there are there are many scenes where the characters are, are talking straight to the to the to the face of the viewers and yeah. it's it's such a it's such a vis- it leaves such a visceral uh, impact uh, can you talk yeah. about those uh, choices yeah we just wanted again to make the audience feel uneasy it's very like you know, we, we kept our eyelines deliberately very close to the camera or sometimes straight over the top of it. You know, there's some, when people are talking to Rose, like when she's talking to, you know, her, um, Joel, her ex-boyfriend, who's the police officer and the other guy that's interrogating, sort of, you know, interviewing her, you know, we wanted it, it to feel like, every, you know, just fixated on her and have a, have all the eyelines sort of straight over the, the camera. And, and yeah, I guess, I guess it's just trying to make people feel awkward and, un- yeah. and uneasy. Because, you know, the obvious choice is to obviously have cleaner eye lines that go, you know, and we did that for some of the film, but there were, you're right, like there's a, it was a deliberate choice, you know, when they're in the car together with Trevor, her, her boyfriend, and they're looking at one another, you know, we wanted that we put like, basically, they're looking just to the, to the left or the right of the, of the lens, like we wanted it to be very personal. Um, so, yeah, no, that was, it was a deliberate choice. And, um, you know, hopefully it made people feel that way yeah. hopefully it doesn't look it like did. a mistake <laughs> yeah it did so uh, one of my final questions would be uh how do you know whether a scare is working or not when you're shooting it if it's sure. a if it's a joke i can understand that if people on the set laugh you know that it's working but mm-hmm. when it comes to a scare how do you know whether it's working or not um it's a very good question because i think with experience and good writing um that the, you you have a good idea that it's you think it's going to work so you go in with confidence but you never really know you don't really know until it all comes together with editing the music's a huge part about it the the you know the the yeah we were really fortunate to have an amazing composer um Cristobal who um I think he did a great job but when you add all of the different elements together and it needs to be lit well and the performance needs to be right and all that stuff you don't really know until an audience sees it. Um, unfortunately, with Smile, um, it tested very well. So that's when, before they locked off the edit, they did some test screenings and it tested highly. And I think I wasn't at the test screenings, but I spoke to Parker afterwards and he was like, oh, the, the jump scares and those moments, like people were actively like, ah, you know, like, <laughs> so I, I guess it's not until you see, you see it play out in front of an audience, you don't really know. I, I just think with experience, like, you know, someone like Alfred Hitchcock became a master at it, you know, because he was very good, but he also did it for decades or, you know, a long time anyway. Um, so I, I'm sure when he was crafting scares and things like that and tension, he was, an, he was a master. So he was able to probably have a very good idea and a lot of confidence that it was going to work. But I, I, until you until it's really out there to an audience, you don't know. Um, so, yeah, but I guess then you learn some tricks and then you maybe bring it on to the next project and and then you get better at it but um but yeah there were a few moments that we did some some of the scares and 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 you think it's going to work but until you maybe hear back from the editor he was obviously giving us a lot of notes and he was doing like rough cuts and and sometimes you would hear oh yeah this is cool it's working (laughs) and then um uh yeah so then that you might you might have an idea a little bit earlier but again it's not until the audience see it so yeah what was your first reaction when you watched the watch the final film um, I was really happy because I saw some of the edits along the way. Like I was able to go into Paramount and Parker and the editor um, get like presented a screening to me, which I was very grateful for. And that was exciting. Um, and I liked it, but I, it wasn't quite finished. A lot of the VFX hadn't been finished. Um, the music was only temp. Um, the color wasn't there. So uh, I have to admit, you know, we all look at our own work when I was there, I'm sort of like enjoying it. I'm going, this is a great, but I'm also looking at, oh, we need to do that in the color grade or, you know, that. And, you you know, you're kind of, you're still working, you know? So right. it wasn't, an, and then in the color grade, you, you're quite often, you're stopping and starting so quickly, so often. And sometimes you don't even really play the music or the dialogue half the time. Like sometimes you do, you watch it back with dialogue, but you're really just looking at all the images and, and, and grading. So, um, you know what? It wasn't until the premiere that played at Austin, Texas here at Fantastic. I think it was the first time I actually saw it with the score and 
and everything. And um, and I I was I was yeah, it was great. I was you always get nervous. You get nervous for everybody. You know, nervous for Parker. You want it to go well. You know that there's a lot of people from the media there. Um, but when I heard people, you know, scream and laugh and cry, or cry maybe <laughs> um, jump, you know, when you see the reaction and you feel that um, and nervous laughter, like there's intentionally some funny moments in in yeah, Rose yeah. In, in Smile. It's meant to be absurd at times. So hearing people laugh at those moments was great. Um, so yeah, it was a good feeling, I guess it was, it was, I'm, I'm glad that it's out at the, you know, it's all around the world and, um, you know, people like yourself are picking up on it and, and watching it and, um, it's great. It's, uh, it's exciting. So yeah, I'm just, just happy that it's, it's, you know, it's, it's out there. <laughs> Lovely. My penultimate question, uh, what was the biggest challenge with respect to Smile? Okay. Um, I think it's just every time you do a film, it's a marathon. I think it's like, you know, there's, there was strict there was a strict schedule. We had a strict budget and a strict schedule and a lot to do. So it's just maintaining that consistency and, and then trying to get your days, you know, like they don't look at overtime too fondly, you know, it's expensive. So um, we weren't able to do any overtime, which is fine because then, you know, rest is important. I'm a big advocate for crew, you know, having having good rest and then working hard and then having good rest. And, you know, that's just something that we have in our industry that that is a bit difficult at times. Um, so you know, it's trying to fit a lot into a, the allocated amount of time day after day after day. And I think that 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 becomes difficult when you have a lot to do. And, you know, um, producers have a budget and they need you to, you know, help do your part in in keeping it to budget. And, you know, it, it gets stressful sometimes. So I think that was our hardest part. Um, there were some technical things about the film I found difficult. But, uh, you know, overall, when you have good people around you, good technicians, good VFX artists, good gaffers and grips and camera assistants and and someone great like parker and, and you know you you collaborate and you figure the technical things out i think the hardest thing was the schedule and just you know not having to give up too much on our vision in order to make the day you know we wanted to have the shots that we want to you know you want to be able to spend the time getting it right and not just rushing through it all and that's the that was the biggest challenge it's just trying to find that balance i think you guys filmed for what 32 days it was actually 30. I think I've been telling people 32, but it was actually, I've been corrected on it. It was 31 plus okay. um, we did like a, like a splinter unit drone day, B unit day, like on a Saturday. Drone, so, yeah. so yeah, 32 technically 31 main, main days. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. An additional question. I'm so sorry because you, you right. mentioned about drone and uh, yeah. I like how you guys inverted the image uh, with the drone. Uh, yeah, cool. So these things are generally done by the second unit, right? So, uh, how much of uh, of a creative control do you have uh, on these on the, like you said on on B rolls? Yep, sure. Um, so Parker and like myself want to be involved, you know, with everything. You know, like we don't like like I a lot of respect the great second unit people, and you you, you want to find people that you trust, and and that's great. That's the way it works, especially when projects are bigger. Um, but in this case, like we were, we had a like a, a great conversation with our drone operator and. We actually were, we we scheduled it so it could be on a Saturday so Parker and I could be there. Um, he was a great operator though, like and, and very creative in his own right. Um, there was one afternoon though, where we, I think it was in the trailer even, the uh, Newark in New Jersey, the city where it's sort of, yeah. that uh, uh, that was, they had their own time for that. So we weren't there for that, but we, but again, like we gave them a, a brief, you know, we wanted, we told the drone operator to be weird and basically flip the world upside down and, you know, to reflect Rose's emotion. So that's essentially where that came from, you know, everything just sort of warping and twisting and turning. So yeah, we, we like to be very involved, but um, you can't always be there. So it's about finding people that you trust to go out there and, and, and that understand the vision, you know, they need to know the script and they need to know um, what you're trying to do, because if not, and I've experienced this before when, when people just come on for a day, and they're not as invested. They go off and they do their own thing, and you know, they come. It's not right. So um, I want to be, you know, really careful in the future to bring people on that have an understanding and investment in the in the project. And uh, I think fortunately we had that. So yeah. So uh, a final question: uh, What are some of your favorite uh, shots from uh, Smile? Oh, um, it's a good question. I don't know. The, I like some of the transitions that we did. Like I do like the shot above the bed where we come came down and then we revealed the figure in the doorway and I love how it hard cut to her nearly getting hit by a car. 
I, th I think yeah. things like that were really fun and they were a challenge and, and they were also things that we didn't 100% know whether they would work. You know, like we, there was a great idea and I think, you know, we, we executed things, but it wasn't until you see it edited, you're like, yeah, okay, cool. Because, you know, it's a very different cut to go from something dark in her, you know, bedroom to then, a, you know, the car and whipping around and, you know, you, you just want to make sure. And, and that, that particular shot was actually two shots stitched together. It's too dangerous to have her step out in front of a car. So we had to, you know, do the stitch in the whip pan and, and when you get all those elements together, you just, you know, you, you hope that it works. And, and then, um, yeah. So I think there's things like that, those different transitions I really enjoyed. Um, yeah, I, I think that's probably, I liked working with the puppet too. Um, the, the entity, the, the, the monster that represents trauma that was in camera. That's a real puppet created by Tom Woodruff who's a, a fantastic puppeteer and, and, um, an artist and uh, doing that stuff in camera was really cool to work with. It wasn't just digi you know digital effect. I like working with things that are tangible because then you can see them when you're filming. You're not just like wow. filming a space or somebody in a green suit or something like that. It it um that was really fun. So. Wow, perfect. Uh, Charlie, thank you very much for the time no, and sharing pleasure. these insights. I had a lovely time. Uh, cool, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you yeah, very much and all the best for everything you have. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, cool. Bye cool. Bye. Have a good weekend. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye.